off because we've got lots that we want to cover today and I am so excited about interviewing you, Alpida. And I know you've said it's a kind of crazy feeling because you're normally the one sitting in the interviewer's seat. <laughs> so true. And it feels, you know, really strange. And I love the different perspective because I don't get to ask the questions now. So it's <laughs> definitely, you know, <laughs> something that I'm not used to and I want to try it out. So thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> No, I'm really excited. And I, I think um, at least it's not a job interview. So <laughs> you already have a wonderful job. <laughs> you don't want to be employed somewhere else. And that's what we're also really interested about, um, you know, about today is we're really interested in finding out more about what you do. Um, from my perspective as an interviewer, I've been in recruitment for over 25 years, as most of you know. And my passion is training companies to hire the right people and helping people who are going for jobs to be equipped with the confidence and skills that they need to succeed. So my perspective comes from finding out more about you and what you do and how that relates to job interviews. And our topic today is why to weave your story into a, into a job interview. And you're the perfect person to ask about this because if you go to LinkedIn, and the link is in the comments in the chat box, so please do link with us, then you will see that Alpida is a storyteller and a co-active coach. But besides that, she is an effective communicator and relationship builder. She has many years experience in the telecommunications industry in a senior international management level. And she's worked within communication for many years. She's actually um, done some journalism and PR as well. So she's, she's got that training and that understanding. And she is a growth mindset fan, which I think you have to be as a coach. Fluent in five languages. Oh, all respect, Alpida. That is just amazing. That blush now or later. I feel like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> So I kind of want to intrude here, although I love, you know, the introduction and, and setting the ground and, and thank you very much for being uh, here, all of you who took your yes. time for that. And um, actually, it's funny because, as I said, I, I want to make this kind of disclaimer. I know very little about Recruit Me and I have not been so often interviewed. There are people here who are with us today for whom I carry a lot of respect and who have done dozens of job interviews and who know that space very well. What I know though is, and what I love, is that it's fun when you are connecting with others and you're bringing a part of you. And this is what we usually do, you know, mm. through little stories and little experiences. And mm. Somehow, I think this is what also brought us together, Jane, didn't it? Yes, I think we did. We definitely <laughs> connected through that. And I love what you're saying about any kind of interview and um, coaching and anywhere where we show up, we bring a part of us. Mm. And so I know that's something that you're really interested in, Alpida, is finding out more about the parts of people that they bring along with them. And perhaps at this moment, you can tell us a little bit more about that and how it relates to your role as a storyteller and a co-active coach. Tell us a little bit more about what that means. So it's funny, but uh, there has been a shift in me in previous years, and some people know me longer here and some don't know me at all. So I don't see so much myself as a storyteller these days, rather as someone who is really curious about other people's stories and mm -hmm. what do these bring in and how can I inspire and bring out the best in people and what they have to share with their stories because stories usually have something to say about our values, about we are about what we want to bring out there in the world even if it's you know a bit unconscious and this is what gets me excited so 
actually storytelling helped me look at my uh, job as a communicator, as a corporate communication person through different eyes. And this is where, you know, the exciting part started. And mm -hmm. I joined for a wonderful and really eye-opening coaching training with an institute, the Coactive Training Institute. And this is where mm -hmm. I saw, you know, change happening in me. And this mm. change that I have been experiencing and this new, you know, part of me that I have been discovering, I felt there is something that I would like to offer others to discover as well. Mm. I think that's, that's so powerful, Elvida, because everybody... I think is um, there's a sense of calm and connection that comes with discovering who we really are and being able to express that. And that so often happens in stories. That's when other people can understand who we are and what we can bring to the table. But tell us more about why you find storytelling so interesting and so powerful. What is it about storytelling that you love? Let me do this with a short story and I will mm -hmm. try to keep it really short. So uh, you said that I'm Greek and I'm currently based in Athens and we Greeks, I don't know, maybe it has to do with my culture. We love stories from uh, antiquity. So I'm going to share one. There might be a couple of people here who might have shared it, uh, who might have heard it before, yet uh, you will see the connection <laughs> to that. So it's about Pandora's box. And maybe this rings a bell because Pandora box also carries some, you know, um, negative connotation, but I'm going to give it a twist uh, here. So in uh, Greek antiquity, we had, uh, you know, the king of gods, uh, Zeus, and there was a guy called Prometheus who stole the fire from the gods. And Zeus wanted to torture him and punish him. And not only did he torture here, but he also wanted to do something, you know, uh, against his family. So uh, although Prometheus warned his brother, Epimetheus, not to accept any trickery from Zeus, Zeus sent him a lovely woman who was called Pandora. And the name Pandora actually means, you know, the old gifted Pandora. So she was carrying all the gifts. She was beautiful, witty, smart, kind, you name it. And Epimetheus fell for her. And as it usually happens in, you know, weddings, people were bringing gifts and Zeus came with a gift and the gift was a box. And the box came with a warning and the warning was, don't open the box. So Pandora was also curious. And at some point she could not really resist. And she opened it up. And what happened? anger, frustration, pain, hunger, pandemics, all, you know, the evils and the bad things popped out of that. And as she hurried to close it down, there was one whisper. And that whisper was hope. And my name means hope. And I actually like to share this little story to bring some optimism because I feel nowadays, especially working from home, being far maybe from our loved ones and having experienced, you know, so many different changes in this sphere, we all need a little bit of hope and optimism. So that's my little mm. introduction. And why I like stories is simply because I feel that I connect to you in a different way, in a meaningful way. Even if the words sometimes don't come easily, there is something in this space that we are, you know, creating all of us right now that goes beyond words. And for each one of us, it may be something different. And even in a formal setup, like, you know better about job interviews. There is also some form of connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true, Alpita. And I think when I see people going in 
to apply for a role, or when I see hiring managers wanting to make the right hiring decisions, they sometimes struggle to make that connection because it feels like there's this awkward situation. You're in an interview. It's almost forced. You now have whatever it is, 45 minutes, an hour, and you're meant to make this connection. And so some people default to making that connection just because they feel like they look similar or they speak in a similar way or they have a similar background. So they seek for those kinds of connections. But what I love about what you're saying about storytelling is it enables a connection between anyone. And I think that's so important because it takes away the space for bias that can happen when two people are so different that they don't connect. And then often a hiring manager will say, well, they're not suitable for the role. I just don't have a good gut feel about them. But it's really because they couldn't make a connection with that person in the interview. And I love what you're saying about storytelling in that it creates that connection. And even when you were telling the story now about Pandora's box, I could just feel that we're all on the same page. We're all imagining the same story. And after you shared that story and the link and the meaning, you know, your name, Alpida, meaning hope, it just feels like we all have a connection and something we've shared together, even though we're all in different places across the globe. So I love what you're sharing. Thank you. And it's exactly, you know, what you mentioned, this bias that sometimes we carry with us, this mm. judgment that we default to, which is making it harder for us to connect to somebody who's there and letting go of that. And I speak also for myself is easier said than done. <laughs> and coaching, I think, and storytelling is what has at least, you know, supported me in coming out there the way I want to be, simply. Mm. And yeah, I, I think there's some really incredible skills that go with coaching and storytelling. Because even with that, we're saying people could tell stories in a meeting where they want to connect with somebody like a job interview, where it might be difficult to otherwise. But they also need to learn how to tell their story in an engaging way. You know, and you told the story about Pandora's box, and then you really engaged us with the optimism and the hope and your name meaning hope. But yes, how, how would you advise people to be able to tell their story in an interview or somewhere else where they need to connect in an engaging way, in a way <laughs> that does connect? <laughs> It's funny that you ask me that because this is the one thing that I try to avoid doing anymore. I have been so much, you know, in these shoes, uh, consulting people and uh, telling people how to be and how to act. And now I try to, to be more what I preach. And mm -hmm. I try to let others also find their answers. Yet the one thing that has helped me is when I'm clear about my why. And uh, some of you might know that I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek, who has formulated this golden circle uh, thing, the why is at the heart of what we do. And if we start you know, with a clear why, which means what are we here for? What is the purpose? What is the intention of whatever story we are sharing, whatever experience? And mm. what is the impact we would like, you know, to create on others? What is the impact on me when I was sharing the story? And what is the impact on, on you when you were listening to that? You know, mm. these are things that always excite me. So I think each one of us, if we find, you know, our clear why, what is it that we want really, mm. what is the purpose? This is the first hint that I would say that would mm. help us to come out as an engaging storyteller. And, yeah, I and love the that. other thing have to do, you know, with practice, 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 practice. <laughs> and being, you know, ourselves, I mean, I don't believe in this fake it till you make it. I faked it for many years <laughs> and I've been there. And at some point I realized that this didn't work for me. So 
we talk a lot about authenticity and sometimes, you know, I feel it's also becoming a cliche, but coming out there as we are as persons, and this is something where coaching has really empowered me to do that, is so liberating. Yeah. And there are also some other things that come with it. Like for me, for example, I could not imagine talking about something that I'm passionate about without moving my hands or without making some gestures. And these are also nonverbal signs because it's not only the words that you hear me saying, it's also what you get from me. And in some cases, I know it's also very hard and it might be even awkward in job interviews, but our body posture tells more than our actual words. So if these two are not in sync and they are not in alignment, it will show. Yeah, that's so true, Alpita. And I think I sit with a lot of hiring managers and candidates on how to make that connection virtually because you, you don't have as much of your body language to show. And I could see, yes, I'm with you. You know, I also use my hands when there's something that I'm excited about. And it is something that is important to do, whether in person or virtual, is to still show up in a way that shows our energy, that shows our excitement. And as you, as you say, it really shows our why. And that's so important. I even thought back to the story you told, the, Pandora, the story of Pandora's box. I think that's a story that, as you say, has been told many times over many years, but probably for different reasons. Yeah. So the reason you told it, your why, was different than why other people might tell that story. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about why you share that story of Pandora's box? Um, yeah. Thanks. What is what is it that you want to want people to connect to? Yeah, there is a twist there, and true. Most people usually associate Pandora's box with all the evils, with all the bad things. And we usually, you know, tend to think of that as something that is not bringing any real energy. And we forget the other part of the story, the other perspective, because there are always, you know, twists into our stories and there are different, you know, perspectives and it's a choice we make. So my choice when I bring this story is not to focus, you know, on the evil, on the hunger, on the famine or on all the bad things that we inflict upon ourselves, but to focus on this other part that we have, which we tend to forget. And sometimes I also feel that, you know, it's easier to talk about my weaknesses than about my strengths. And I find it happens to us often that we self-sabotage ourselves. Mm. So there are stories in which we may be trapped and they are not helping us to move forward. And what mm. happens if we should, you know, if this pop up? Mm. Yeah, that's so true, Alpita. And I think that, you know, especially if I, if I link that back to a job interview, people have got to, they, they want to tell stories that put them in the best light and that show that they can add value to the role that they're applying for. So as you say, they need to be conscious of their why, they need to be conscious of their audience and the impact that they want to make. And so it's not... Yeah, people, of course, feel uncomfortable about asking questions that relate to people's failure or struggles or challenges. And candidates themselves think, oh, how do I answer those kinds of questions? But if they can answer those questions and focus on a positive impact or outcome, then that changes the whole story. But sometimes, as you're saying, people can be locked into a story that actually sabotages them. And sometimes they don't even realize it. So is there anything more that you can share towards people who, who want to be able to identify, am I stuck in a self-sabotaging story? Or am I telling stories that actually don't have the positive impact that I want to make? What are kind of warning signs that people can look out for? Well, let me say it with an example. Like, for example... Yesterday evening, I was trying, you know, to find some time to put my thoughts in order, to prepare some structure for today 
And usually I'm a very creative person and I have been putting a lot of effort to have structure in my schedules, in my uh, life, in my appointments. And somehow now I don't know, I rebel against it. So anyhow, I went there and I put my thoughts on order. And then I said, okay, let's forget about it now and go to sleep. If I would have self-sabotaged myself, probably I would have aken, waken up in the middle of the night, like sweating and like saying, oh my God, what am I going to do tomorrow? You know, and I would have, yeah, not been able to sleep due to anxiety for or failing, or I would have been burdening, you know, myself with thoughts of failures. Instead, I saw this as an opportunity to experience something else, something new, something where I could learn and I could also offer some others, maybe, you know, some inspiration and tips. And, and talking of tips, what comes up also with self-sabotage and what has helped me also uh, a lot is the work of uh, uh, Shamin Sirzat. Maybe some of you have heard him. He has talked a lot about positive intelligence and uh, he's very well known in, in the coaches circle, but uh, I think it's also worth looking at it beyond because he brings so much clarity in the way that we can become aware, first of all, of our own saboteurs, because how can we find something that we don't even realize? Like, you know, I'm a person that very much likes to control the outcome. How can you control the outcome in a space like that? I mean, I'm not even in control of the technology behind here. Maybe a power cut comes. How could I react to that? <laughs> so there are yeah. things that are out of our control. How do we deal with that? Hmm. Yeah, I think even as you're sharing, Elpida, the words that come to mind are things like reframing. So you have the same situation, but if people can frame that differently and see things as opportunities instead of threats, I think that really helps. And what I see coming through from you as well reminds me of Brene Brown, where she talks about not being afraid of failure and not being afraid of being vulnerable and seeing those as strengths and opportunities to learn and grow. And so again, in a job interview, I think there's so much to be said for people who can confidently share something that they've gone through that was challenging, but they can also share what they learned from it, how they changed. And I think that's important for hiring managers as well, that they don't just share this overly glossy picture about their organization and how perfect it is, because that's not really attractive because, you know, to use our cliched word authentic, it doesn't come across as authentic. Mm. They need to be able to share the very real challenges. They maybe don't have all the solutions yet to the hybrid workforce or workplace, but can they share it in a way that is positive, that brings hope and that where they feel like, okay, it's okay. We can be curious here. We can fail and learn from that. It's okay. And I love how you're bringing this is the other day I was reading something on LinkedIn and it felt, you know, so close to my heart because I feel that we sometimes try so much to be hyper smart, you know, so professional and put the best of us out there while there might be even more learning for us and for others if we would just, you know, bring it out as it comes. And mm -hmm. by this, I don't mean, you know, uh, polarization. I don't mean bias because we have a lot of, of that. However, rather, you know, a place of curiosity, a place of mm -hmm. wonder. What is it that is holding me back? And what is it, you know, that I don't realize about the other person? And it may also mm -hmm. be the same in a job interview setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think going back to stories, if we're able to share that information within a story, then we can take people on the journey with us. And so that's why it is so important to weave our stories into an interview so we have that connection and we can help people visualize the challenge and the positive outcome with us instead of just sharing it as direct speech or rhetoric. So yeah, I love what you're sharing. So, oh, Peter, I know you wanted to actually, sorry, yeah, you look like you want to say something. 
Yeah, you've just reminded me, and I don't want to default back into my culture, but um, there is a wonderful, you know, uh, foundation at this uh, co-active uh, coaching that some of us uh, who are also here now uh, know better. It's what we call, you know, the four cornerstones. And uh, if I may just repeat them here, the first one is that people are naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. So I'm not here to fix you. I'm not here to tell you how to be. I have full confidence that you are aware of what is best for you. The other is focus on the whole person because we all have a tendency, you know, to try to solve problems quickly. But the problem is just one, you know, facet. And if we focus on the whole person, there is so much more in there that we can bring in. And then the other is evoke transformation and transformation doesn't happen, you know, like that. I mean, I don't tell you, please transform. It's not like we are, you know, in the movies. And, and for me, it also happened over time. And it's very different for each and every one of us in what way and in, you know, what is exactly that we want to change. You don't, yeah, prescribe change. And also this brings me to mind um, a bit Aristotle and now I default back into my own native culture because he talked about ethos, pathos, keros, and ethos is, you know, who we are and who we are is what comes out, whether it's on a job interview or whether it is on the conversation with our friends or wherever. And pathos is how, how we want to show up. And Keros is timing because there is also the element of, there might be, you know, some things that are relevant for one specific moment and not relevant. So it's also choosing, you know, the right timing for something. And with this, I don't know, uh, maybe we could try out a small experiment if people would be Ooh. interested in. <laughs> yeah, I think that would ah, be very exciting. Uh, yeah. So, Peter, uh, before we go into the experiment, I'm just going to see if we can end the recording. Um, so, Alpita was, as Alpita was saying, we do want to see if there is something we can try out. But um, firstly, I just want to say I love those four cornerstones and um, I share your passion for coaching. And I think that those are incredible cornerstones to be able to set the frame or perspective for an interview. If people could embrace that perspective from both sides, I think it could be a truly respectful, authentic human experience that would help remove bias and would help people really see who the other person is as they share their stories in that way. So thank you so much for what you've shared. I've really, really loved that. And as you say that, I realized that I actually didn't name one, the one I love the most, which has to do oh, with dancing us. in the moment, which has to do with improvisation, which has to do with you know, not setting up something beforehand and just, you know, co-creating something together. So I completely <laughs> yeah, didn't mention the one I love the most. <laughs> That is all good. I can see how you love that one the most. I mean, interviews have to have some structure to be fair, but I think the co-creation can come when people have respect for one another and they can explore and be curious together about what someone could bring to a role and what an organization could bring to a person's career. So I love that. Thank you so, so much. It's very freeing to hear those cornerstones. Mm -hmm.